Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UVA Medical Center Hour. I'm Justin Mutter, Director of the Medical Center Hour, which is a program of our Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics here at the University of Virginia. Today's event, the annual Jesse Stewart Richardson Lecture in the UVA School of Medicine and UVA Health, affords us an opportunity to turn to the ever-pressing question of quality, patient safety, and value in medicine and in healthcare. We are grateful for the generosity of Dr. Don Richardson and family for this ongoing series of conversations, essential to the future of high value medicine in the United States and across the world. Today's session is in virtual only format. So when it comes time for questions from our Zoom participants, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There are many, many components required to achieve quality assurance and healthcare, but arguably chief among them is an agreed upon definition of what constitutes best evidence in health and medicine. Delineating what is good and what is right in healthcare delivery, therefore inevitably brings us to challenges in conceptualizing scientific knowledge and its translation into everyday practice. Today, we're delighted to welcome Professor Trish Greenhouse, one of the leading international voices in conversations about the future of evidence-based medicine and quality improvement. Dr. Greenhouse is Professor of Primary Care Health Sciences and Fellow of Green Templeton College at the University of Oxford in the UK. She studied medical, social, and political sciences at Cambridge and clinical medicine at Oxford before training first as a diabetologist and later as an academic general practitioner. She holds a doctorate in diabetes care and an MBA in higher education management. And in keeping with this extraordinary multidisciplinary background and interest at Oxford, she leads a program of research at the interface between medicine and the social sciences. A prolific thinker and writer, Professor Greenhouse is offer, author of over 400 peer-reviewed publications and 16 textbooks. Her many awards include the OBE for Services to Medicine by Her Majesty the Queen in 2001, Fellow of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences in 2014, and in recognition of the global impact of her work, election as a fellow to the US National Academy of Medicine in 2001. Professor Greenhouse, welcome to our Medical Center Hour stage. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, give this talk, and the, the technical rehearsal went well, so I hope you can now see my opening slide, which should say something in the air. Am, am I with you? Nobody's saying no. Um, so thank you for coming everybody thank you for inviting me i'm going to be talking about something in the air hospital infection control policies and the crisis in ebm um before i start i i just want to to acknowledge where this richardson lecture series came from um and to remember jesse stewart richardson uh, her son, Don Richardson, who I understand may actually be watching, and also her daughter-in-law, Sheila Ammerman Richardson. Um, those of you who don't know the story, you should look it up, uh, because this is such a privilege to be part of this lecture series, um, which began, I think, when Sheila had a word with Don and suggested that he um, do something positive following the death of his mother uh, from medical error. As you'll hear, I too have lost a parent from something bad happening in a hospital. Uh, so, so Don, I really reach out to you and um, I hope um, I will do her memory justice uh, with this lecture. I'm gonna talk about four things, briefly about puerperal fever, then about cholera, also about COVID-19, and I'm going to talk about the crisis in evidence-based medicine. Uh, and I've color coded my slides. So if it's red, I'm talking about puerperal fever, et cetera. I hope that's enough of a kind of scaffolding for this talk. Um, but first of all, I told you I lost um, my mother uh, because of something bad happening in a hospital. Uh, my mother on the right died of COVID. But before that, 
my grandmother, my father's mother um, died uh, very young of puerperal fever. I'd never seen a photograph of her before I prepared this lecture, but I emailed around my relatives uh, and someone, this is her on her wedding day, uh, very soon after uh, she was dead from childbed fever. Uh, my mother um, broke a leg, was admitted to hospital in the middle of one of the very early COVID waves. Um, I had a sinking feeling when she went into hospital that she would catch COVID there, uh, as indeed she did, uh, and died of COVID very sadly uh, in just after Christmas in 2020. Um, so, so I feel this, um, I feel for, on a personal level that we really need to get infection control uh, in hospitals and other healthcare settings. Um, we need to do better at it. So briefly, just to warm us up really, puerperal fever, I know some of you are real experts in infectious diseases um, and I'm not. Uh, so apologies if I get some of the detail wrong, but my understanding, I'm just going to tell you a little vignette about this. As I say, it's not the main focus of this talk. Most of you, whether you're a student all the way through to professors, will have heard of Ignaz Semmelweis, who as a young doctor in Vienna noticed um, he was the pink clinic. This graph is, is death rate, the mortality rate of mothers who give birth in two different uh, hospitals and he was the pink one. And you can see one year it went right up above 15%, 15% of women were dying uh, in childbirth. Um, and then there was another, another clinic where far fewer people were dying to such an extent that the women wouldn't go to the first hospital, they refused to go. And the story goes that Semmelweis worked out that this was an infection transmitted by the hands and actually, the thing he did uh, was to stop people coming straight from the post-mortem um, uh, setting uh, and then putting their hands uh, on patients. In 1847, a medical student uh, was a little bit um, trigger happy with a scalpel, accidentally stabbed a member of staff with a scalpel. And that member of staff uh, died of something that looked very similar to um, puerperal fever. It was actually a man. Uh, and then Semmelweis realized, hang on, something's being transmitted. And then there was the hand washing. Um, all sorts of other characters are part of this story. Um, I've named one, Oliver Wen Wendell Holmes. Uh, and Florence Nightingale picked up on it pretty quickly and started doing hand washing in Crimea. But the point about this slide is actually um, most people were not aware and didn't follow this practice until Louis Pasteur came along a few uh, years later. These are not the, the, the years they were alive. These are the, were the years they were doing their science. Um, and Robert Koch, of course, uh, actually looked down a microscope and, and saw these bugs. So suddenly um, we've got a, a reason, something you could see. But actually, uh, and this is the point of, of this bit of the story, um, the general thinking between the 1840s to the 1860s was that childbed fever was spread via bad air, miasma. Uh, and Semmelweis was saying there's a lot of evidence of it spreads on the hands and people were ignoring him and saying, no, nope, there's no evidence, no need to wash hands. And so most places um, up to the death of Semmelweis were not doing hand washing. And it is ironic that uh, Semmelweis himself uh, died of sepsis, uh, incurred in, in an institution, but that's another story. All right, let's now move to cholera. Um, and we're still in the 19th century. And I don't know about you people in the USA, but every medical student in the UK knows this story about Dr. John Snow, uh, a public health doctor in London. Soho, that's what the map is. That's a, a part of London. Um, which uh, um, at the time was a rather poor part of London. Now it's a rather well-to-do part. There's a picture, in a modern day picture of this pump and snow, you may well know, removed the handle from the pump because he got an idea that this was contaminated water that was causing the cholera uh, outbreak. Um, and the outbreak very quickly cleared up. But, but the real story is how no, nobody took any notice of him. And this book um, by, um, I think it's called Stephen Johnson, uh, 
delineates how long it took for Jon Snow's message. Uh, this is a bit the medical students don't remember, but Edwin Chadwick. Now, Edwin Chadwick was a good guy. He was a social reformer. He was, he was really into public health. Unfortunately, he got the mechanism of spread of cholera wrong. So he was very firmly adherent to the miasma theory of cholera. It was spread by foul air, which basically meant the smell of sewage. And there was plenty of that around in 19th century London. Now look, here is the data that was collected in the mid 1800s to inform the science of cholera spread. This is, this is the data that was collected. And now you might think, well, what data wasn't being collected? Well, they, they, they were very interested in the weather conditions, temperature and humidity. The smell of the air was meticulously recorded every day. The elevation of the land, because there was some hypothesis that, that the miasma stayed low to the ground. Um, whether the houses looked and smelt clean and, and whether the containers used for the water uh, were clean. They weren't really uh, analyzing the water itself. So that was an interesting one. John Snow and his partner, Henry Whitehead, went in and said, well, we'd like to ask another question. Where did the people get their water? Which pump did it come from? And that question was added to the weekly statistical returns in 1853 and it only took a few months for them to work out, goodness me, almost everybody who's getting cholera is drinking water from this particular pump. And so they quickly removed the handle. But that, as I said, is not the end of the story. Look at this. This is 1855. This is the year after he's removed the handle, after the outbreak has uh, stopped, really. Um, it has been suggested that the real cause um, is water contaminated. Oops, Daisy. Just move that. Is water contaminated with the rice water evacuations of cholera patients? And then this is this is the National Board of Health. Um, and don't just look at what's being said in this yellow bit. Look at the tone of it. After careful inquiry, we see no reason to adopt this belief. We do not find it established that the water was contaminated in the manner alleged. Nor is there before us any sufficient evidence to show blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I'm going to draw your attention to the tone of some modern day statements, uh, which are rather similar to this. They don't say what that careful inquiry was. Uh, it's just a sort of general uh, careful inquiry. Um, this uh, this I, I find extraordinary, actually, um, that scientific uh, statements or, or statements like this, which claim to be scientific without actually giving any evidence as to how they've come to that conclusion. This was um, the editor of The Lancet at the time um, who wrote this very disparaging comment uh, about Jon Snow in riding his hobby horse very hard. He's fallen through a hole, never been able to get out again. Um, John Snow died in 1858. The miasma theory of cholera, cholera persisted and continued to influence policy until another devastating cholera outbreak in London in 1866. 93% of all victims of that uh, outbreak were customers of a particular water company. And even then, it didn't happen with a bang. It happened rather slowly over years and years. The miasma theory of cholera was slowly replaced by a waterborne theory. And as I showed you earlier on, this was when they were beginning to look down microscopes and actually see these microbes. Um, now, let's come to the 21st century and see what's happening with COVID-19. Well, just to kind of cut to the chase, we published this paper in the British Medical Journal a few months ago called How COVID-19 Spreads Narratives, Counter-Narratives and Social Dramas. And in a nutshell, um, we showed in this paper, and it was summarizing previous papers that we'd written, um, that a, a flawed narrative that uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 was transmitted by droplets, um, took hold very early on, 
um, and became entrenched. And that began with uh, the World Health Organization and then spread uh, around the world very quickly. There were various experts in aerosol science who were saying, well, actually, there's a lot of evidence that it spreads via the air, um, but this didn't catch on. And, and this BMJ paper, and, and along with uh, a number of other papers that I've written in, in more detail, uh, this paper's a bit of a summary paper, um, the message kept coming and still comes actually from the WHO, keep washing hands. Um, and other measures linked to droplet uh, transmission. So surface cleansing, um, physical distancing. These, these were overemphasized. I'm not saying they're bad things to do. You know, I've had kids, you have to teach them to wash their hands. You have to keep surfaces clean. But what was ignored uh, and overlooked and, and often still is, um, attention to indoor air quality, reducing indoor crowding, uh, reducing the time people spend indoors, and also high-grade respiratory protection with respirators. All these were either denied or underemphasized. So let's take you through this. I have a slight problem with, there we are. In about nine months ago, um, Diane Lewis uh, published this piece in Nature um, and highlighted the story. She's, she's a science journalist and she's done some really good kind of investigative journalism on what went on. Uh, and she pointed out that the WHO had announced in March 2020, uh, COVID is not airborne. This is a fake news. Uh, and in July 2020, 237 aerosol scientists wrote to the WHO uh, and offered their help. They say there's overwhelming evidence of airborne transmission. And the WHO didn't reply. Um, Dr. John Conley, who I'm going to talk about, was a, a co-author on Hennigan's review, which again, I'm going to talk about, and, and chair of this WHO committee, which rejected the idea uh, of airborne transmission for more than two years. Uh, and actually I attended one meeting of that committee in um, early October. And this is a letter I wrote to one of the senior members of the committee um, because I was actually rather shocked at what I saw. I saw some presentations uh, from a group who were being received as experts, uh, but I was a bit concerned that, that, that the, they hadn't looked at aerosol science. Uh, and I had a phone call with uh, Ben Detta Allegranzi um, after that meeting, and I thought I'd follow it up with a letter. I said the perspectives presented to the committee at its recent meeting lacked the nuanced expertise of people who've been rigorously trained in aerosol science. Uh, and then said these people have never published anything on aerosol science. They may have inadvertently missed some key material and approaches, even while using review methods that seem to be robust. Um, as might be expected, given their biomedical background, they seem to have been overly influenced by a biomedical paradigm, which may not transfer in a valid way to this very different branch of science. I didn't get a reply to that, even though she told me on the phone that they were going to contact the aerosol scientists, and that's why I was invited to uh, send names, but, but they didn't do that. Um, okay. Let's now talk about the crisis in evidence-based medicine. Many of you will be very familiar with this hierarchy of evidence with the um, expert opinion at the bottom, uh, systematic reviews and randomized trials at the top. The idea is that uh, if it's in the red, uh, that's good. And, and the lower down the hierarchy of evidence you get, uh, that's less good. Uh, and many of you will know, of course, that even the founding fathers uh, and mothers, I suppose, of evidence-based medicine would say, hang on, that's not, not always the case that, you know, there are, that you've got to tailor your evidence types to your research questions, all that kind of thing. But broadly speaking, this hierarchy of evidence is um, dearly held and loved by the EBM community. Um, and what I've been doing through the pandemic, I did it a bit before the pandemic, what I've been doing through the pandemic is raising concern about this. And I should say, you know, I'm a cancer survivor. I'm only alive because of a randomized controlled trial. Uh, I'm not opposed to RCTs of drug treatments by any means, but I 
believe very strongly, and I've argued in peer-reviewed papers, EBM must urgently change from its near exclusive reliance on RCTs and take greater account of evidence of mechanisms. How does this transmit? So we published, I published this early paper in PLOS Medicine and one more recently with colleagues called Adapt or Die. Um, and this is a gauntlet for the EBM community. I published it in a journal called BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine, which was a bit cheeky of me, but, you know, and, and people wrote in and said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, but I've deliberately published in the EBM journal uh, and we've had some interesting discussions. Okay, let me take you through the arguments. Uh, published this paper uh, called Miasmas, Mental Models and Preventive Public Health, talking about both the cholera example and the COVID example there. Uh, and I began that paper by quoting Immanuel Kant, who said thoughts without content are empty, intuitions without concepts are blind. Uh, and Kant always was a bit of a difficult philosopher to follow. But Sean Carroll in the big picture, I think, paraphrased it. Theory without data is blind. Data without theory is lame. In other words, you need both theory and data. And by theory here, I mean an idea of the mechanism of how the bug spreads. Uh, one of my great heroes is uh, Sir Peter Medawa, uh, who is an immunologist. He won Nobel Prizes, um, but he's also a philosopher of science. And in this wonderful monograph, Induction and Intuition in Scientific Thought, which he published in 1969, he says scientists need to do more than browse over the field of nature like cows at pasture chomping on the data. He says scientific reasoning is not merely the apprehension of facts, but an exploratory dialogue that can always be resolved into two voices, imaginative and critical. The initiative for scientific action comes not from the apprehension of facts, but from an imaginative preconception of what might be true. I think back to the cholera example. Why were they collecting the data they were collecting? Because they had an imaginative preconception that this was all about the air. Once Jon Snow shifted to this hypothesis about the water, imagining a different mechanism, then he started to collect a different set of data. So Meadow, um, among others, were, uh, had um, brought together these two components of, of science. He sometimes called them, calls them the bride and the groom. Uh, you need to think about mechanisms before you uh, start testing your hypothesis. OK, so let's go back to March, April 2020. Here is the famous, infamous tweet from the WHO saying COVID is not airborne. And this is a paper that I published just days later, um, suggesting that it might be admitting that we didn't know and arguing for the precautionary principle. Again, I acknowledge colleagues who co-authored that paper. Um, but what we were doing was saying we don't have 100% proof yet, but let's act pragmatically on the basis of a number of stories. And I was particularly influenced by super spreading events. Uh, there was a, a performance of the, um, I think it was the St. John Passion in Amsterdam on the 8th of March, which led to a, something like 130 cases of COVID, four deaths the conductor of the orchestra ended up on intensive care, you know, that kind of thing. You think, how did that happen? Did they all touch the same doorknob? Possibly it's something in the air. So it was on the basis of that kind of uh, quite speculative uh, evidence, but saying, wait a minute, this pandemic could be quite catastrophic. Why don't we just wear some masks just in case? Um, a year later, as you know, a lot had happened. Um, one of the things that had happened was I'd lost my own mother to COVID. It had got very real. Um, Carl Hennigan, this was a Hennigan review I, I, I referred to earlier, and colleagues, including John Conley, who was chairing the WHO committee that was making the decisions, had produced something they called a living systematic review. Um, it's... Uh, 
hadn't yet been peer reviewed, although it, it subsequently was peer reviewed uh, and failed peer review, uh, saying there was really no evidence for airborne transmission. And I was very worried about that, very worried indeed, because I felt that the aerosol scientists had already demonstrated uh, beyond reasonable doubt that it was uh, an airborne disease. And so I got together with uh, a number of aerosol scientists around the world, and we produced this very short review for The Lancet. It was less than 1,500 words long. We were only allowed 20 references or something. They were quite strict about that. 10 scientific reasons in support of airborne transmission. Uh, and this went viral. We made sure it did. We actually included a, um, a New York Times journalist on the, on the co-author list. Um, we, we played our networks. We went on television. Uh, and you can see the Altmetric score was absolutely through the roof. It was one of the top 20 um, tweeted about papers of all time. Uh, and we really pushed this narrative. Uh, but it was peer reviewed and we listed various forms of evidence, which I'll go through uh, in a minute. But before I do, uh, let's come back to the crisis in evidence-based medicine, the philosophy of evidence-based medicine. The assumption of the EBM community, broadly speaking, is that there is a hierarchy of evidence and it is a methods-based hierarchy. In other words, uh, quality comes from using the approved method. Good science uh, is science that has used these methods. Um, some methods are better than others. And if participants are randomized, that's good science. If they're not randomized, it's less good science. I'm slightly caricaturing, but only slightly. Here they are. Um, and it's sort of a coincidence that these people are working in the same department as me. It's a very big department. There's 500 of us. We don't see each other much. But this is what had happened in the systematic review uh, of masks. Uh, what they did was they didn't look at any kind of evidence except randomized controlled trials. So, so they I put the rest of the hierarchy of evidence into the trash can. Uh, and this is there's a lot more trials on the use of masks now, but they're still coming to the same conclusion that there's no effect uh, either on healthcare workers or in community settings. Um, this review was picked up by President Trump's COVID-19 advisor. Um, and was quoting it. And actually, this review uh, influenced US policy as well as UK policy, as well as policy around the world. I'm not in um, wearing this hat. I'm, I'm not an, in the evidence-based medicine camp, although I've done a lot of work on evidence-based medicine. As I say, I'm, I'm not opposed to it in its place. But in terms of protecting the public, uh, I'm in the pragmatic public health tribe who make different assumptions about the nature of evidence. This tribe says there is no universally applicable hierarchy of evidence, though some methods may be more or less fit for purpose. Good science uh, in this group uh, is assumed to be defined by the use of multiple methods, uh, adaptively and pragmatically to build a nuanced narrative of what's happened and why. So we have a bit of this and a bit of this and a bit of this and a bit of this, put it all together. Uh, we have to explain all the evidence. We can't just chuck away the evidence and say, we're only gonna look at the randomized trial. Um, in this group, theory is at least as important as method. We have to have a mechanistic explanation of what's going on, uh, a theory of change, if you like. And the narrative needs to make sense um, so that, um, I've called it the natives, but we, we have to produce a, a total picture of all the evidence and then feed it back to stakeholders and say, well, have we accounted for everything? So there's a very different way of looking at uh, scientific evidence. So let's have a look at some of the evidence that was ignored right at the beginning and is still being ignored. Um, there's some really interesting stuff. Um, I started working with um, a woman who's the world authority on the aerodynamics of sneezing. And, and she's you know, publishing in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, but you can light up a sneeze uh, in the laboratory. It's not an RCT, but you, you, it actually is a pretty good way of measuring how far some of that those 
turbulent gas clouds, as she calls them, uh, are traveling. Um, and then there was the uh, very famous study of the Skagit uh, choir practice where 60 people or 62 people showed up for a rehearsal. They split halfway through the evening into two different rooms or, you know, one, one group went in one and one group went in another room. And then a very high proportion of that choir uh, went down with COVID. Two of them died, and then uh, through the secondary infections, another two people died. Um, and a very meticulous study was done by um, Shelley Miller's group, uh, which was subsequently reported, uh, written up in a in a um, peer-reviewed journal. Um, how did we explain how so many people became unwell uh, from singing? Uh, and there's been a number of these. We were, I've actually been working with Rainer McIntyre on a on a systematic review of, of some of these case studies uh, quite recently, which we've submitted for publication. Here's some other evidence that was ignored. These natural experiments of masking policies where the this is a graph of mortality within the first 100 days of the first case in any country. And the blue and the orange lines are how many cases happened in those in countries that used uh, that introduced masking policies uh, before 30 days versus how many cases happened in countries that didn't introduce masking by 100 days. Um, and these are these are relatively early uh, figures, but you can see hundreds of thousands of deaths uh, in those red countries where people weren't masking uh, and hardly any deaths in the countries, the Asian countries, where masking was much more culturally accepted. Now, of course, lots of things might explain that, confounders. Uh, and yes, there's all sorts of studies where people have tried to control for those uh, confounders, but I, I'm not sure we need to overthink this. Actually, the Asian countries got on it really quickly. They all wore masks. Uh, the Western countries didn't. They didn't wear masks and they had lots more deaths. It really is that simple. Look at these animal experiments. This is an interesting one because the hierarchy of evidence says the animal experiment is right at the bottom of the hierarchy. Uh, and what they mean by that is if you give an animal a drug and the animal gets better, that doesn't mean a human's going to get better. So you're using the animal as a model for the human. That's not what's happening here. What's happening here, and again, this is a paper published in Nature, it's not a bad journal, is you can see you've got an infected animal, um, and then you've got an animal that was healthy, um, and the uh, cages are connected through an air duct that goes around corners, so you can't say it was any droplets because the droplets wouldn't go around the corners and, and wouldn't go uh, against gravity. Uh, guess what? The ferret, uh, the healthy ferret, becomes sick very predictably, um, and you cannot explain that. It, with any other explanation than uh, the bug is traveling in the air. Um, the problem is that the EBM hierarchy says, well, it's an animal study. But this, in this uh, study, the animal is simply uh, an indicator of what's going on in the air. So let's summarize. The EBM traditionalists are saying, well, there's no evidence. Um, because what we want is consistent and direct isolation of viable virus from air samples. And then we want consistent and direct infection of humans from sharing air. Um, and that's because we can't do RCTs of randomizing people to stand in, in the air, all that kind of thing. But actually what we did, uh, public health scientists working with aerosol scientists, we said, wait a minute, add up these different kinds of evidence. Uh, you cannot explain these findings unless you invoke an aerosol route, the super spreading events, the long range transmission, for example, in quarantine hotels, asymptomatic transmission. Um, nobody's sneezing, nobody's coughing. Uh, people uh, actually, I think about half the people who pass on COVID-19 do not have symptoms at the time. Um, they're just breathing. Um, it's much more commonly transmitted indoors than outdoors, about 20 times as likely to catch it indoors than outdoors. The ferret experiments, some air sampling uh, experiments have identified live virus, some haven't. Um, 
It uh, is found in air filters when you filter out the air um, and hospital acquired COVID is massively reduced by wearing um, high grade uh, respiratory protection. So the review that said otherwise, look at the tone here, the lack of recovery of viral COVID that prevents firm conclusions to be drawn. So they're saying, well, we, there's still not enough evidence. The current evidence is low quality. Uh, meaning, well, there's not enough RCTs. There is an urgent need to standardize methods and improve reporting. So depicting the state of the evidence as insufficient to act. This is exactly what they did uh, to uh, John Snow. So we wrote a paper, uh, and the social scientists among you will probably find this interesting. The philosophers among you will probably find it interesting because we used... Um, a theoretical framework from, from Bourdieu saying mental models are not neutral. They're, they're linked to something called scientific capital. And some, by scientific capital, we meant, well, power and prestige and accolades and influence. Um, and people who've got a lot of scientific capital are going to defend that capital. They don't want to lose that capital. And we felt that what was going on at the WHO um, was uh, explained by what Bourdieu would call the orthodoxy view, that was the mainstream view held by the people who've got the power, versus the heterodoxy view, which is the view held by people who don't have the power, in this case, the aerosol scientists. So if you want to go deeper into Bourdieu, uh, he's written this great book, Science of Science and Reflexivity, the power and prestige that comes with one's role as a scientist. Why would a scientist want to lose that? Um, John Conley has a lot of scientific capital. This is the opening slide that he puts uh, when he gives a lecture. Uh, you can see how many positions of leadership he has. And of course, this is quite... Um, traditional when you're introducing someone to give a talk I mean you know you did it to me just now you know oh she's published all these papers and she got this award and she's you know holds a tenured professorship at Oxford that's presenting me as having a lot of scientific capital um of course if if, if what you've got to say is any good you don't need that introduction but we do have a tradition of of making those um Benedetta Alagranzi who's another member of the committee the woman I, I actually spoke to and wrote to and you can see she's actually about to um, speak at one of the big uh, world, the World Sepsis Congress. And again, you can see the scientific capital being uh, displayed here, the professorship, and she's got this award and that award, and she's involved in this, that, and the other. Now, look, what are these people doing? Um, actually, they've been studying hand washing since the 1980s. Um, John Conley hand washing practices. That's that's what he did. I'm not sure he didn't do his PhD on it, but he's been doing it ever since. He compares different techniques for surgeons to wash their hands. He makes educational videos uh, about hand hygiene. Um, these were just some of many, many uh, papers that are written by uh, this group um, all about hand hygiene. So let me bring you back to Medawa's slide. The initiative for scientific action comes not from the apprehension of facts, but from an imaginative preconception of what might be true. And I put it to you, the reason why the WHO put out that tweet in March 2020 saying COVID is not airborne was because uh, people on that key committee were already thinking hand washing and therefore they were already thinking droplets. Here we have uh, something that was just from two weeks ago, an update of a Cochrane review on physical interventions to interrupt or reduce the spread of respiratory viruses. And once again, they have uh, rejected any evidence that isn't, uh, isn't a randomized controlled trial and they've come up with the conclusion that hand washing works uh, and that there's no evidence for wearing masks. Uh, we don't agree. Last week, we, we published uh, something in the conversation. Masks do reduce the risk of spreading COVID, despite this review saying they don't. This is now um, uh, this piece in the conversation has been 
uh, read by several hundred thousand people, and there's a right old argument going on. Many of you may have contributed to it. Uh, the question of why Dr. Conley's team keep finding that masks don't work when they do, well, I've got a whole other lecture on that, which I'm not going to uh, uh, bore you with now. Um, here are some references if you'd like to. Uh, I think someone's recording this, so you can go back afterwards or, or quickly take a picture of that um, set of references, but I can send them to you if you want. And thanking my research funders, which I always like to do. So thank you for your attention. I'm now going to stop sharing and I'm ready to take questions. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Greenhouse. And I know they're gonna be a lot of interesting questions uh, coming through, and please uh, go ahead and put those questions uh, in the Q and A tab at the bottom of your of your Zoom screen, and we will uh, pass those along in the midst of our of our conversation. But but just to start us off, I mean, I think you've given us a lot to to think about and a lot to to unpack. And and one of the things that uh, I want to go back to this this importance of theory, and you really connected it with mechanisms. Um, and it seems like when we when it comes to making sure we get the theory right part of what we need to do is stop and say what kind of question am i asking yes. what kind of problem am i trying to solve yes. uh, because as i as i take it uh what you're saying is it's not of course that that randomized control trials and systematic reviews are unimportant and and not that they in in various uh, for various questions and for various problems that they do present a certain hierarchy that we need to follow. Mm. But for other questions and other problems, we need to think about asking uh, uh, or starting it from a different place, one might seem. Does that, does that sound that accurate? That's half of it. Yes, I would absolutely agree with everything you said there. The other half of it is that, and, and I'm going back to Sir Austin Bradford Hill, who did the first randomized controlled trial in the UK and the infectious diseases people among you will know about this. This was streptomycin and tuberculosis. Uh, and Bradford Hill developed the Bradford Hill criteria um, for causality. And one of the things he said, you know, he said, yes, you need uh, an RCT. If we're gonna say, does streptomycin work in, in tuberculosis, we've got to randomize. And he, he was passionate about that, but he also said that alone is not enough. You have to explain every item of evidence that comes your way. Now, if the item of evidence is somebody's next door neighbor telling a story over the garden fence, then you can say, wait a minute, that's not science. But if I say, just a second, the engineers tell me that these filters will filter out 99% of the particles. So does it make any sense when you say it has no effect? You've got to explain um, the engineering evidence. You've got to explain the super spreading events. Um, you've got to explain that ferret study with the ferret in the cage catching COVID from the sick ferret in the other cage. It's no good saying, no, we're not, we're ignoring that evidence. We're going to define it as, as low quality. No, it was a high quality. It was a really good ferret experiment. So you have to explain all the evidence. And Bradford Hill said that. The, the you know, one of the, the, the kind of pre-founding file, he wasn't EBM, but he, you know, he, the EBM people love Bradford Hill. Um, and yet they haven't read Bradford Hill. You know, they, they, they've, um, this is what, what we said in that paper that we published in um, BMJ EBM. Uh, so, you, so in addition to matching your question with what the actual problem is and matching the study design with the question, you've also got to explain all the evidence, not just the evidence that you've picked out. Um, well, the, the, the... The question that just came in uh, uh, through our Q and A tab here, I want to uh, relay that because I think it connects to what we're what we're talking about here. I mean, uh, going back to this importance of of identifying the proper question and identifying the proper uh, proper problem uh, and, uh, and aligning our theories and methods uh, with that, uh, a lot of the evidence you pro have provided today has been focused on public health problems and questions in particular. Um, but one uh, individual in our chat has said, 
Uh, do you believe the approach of taking all the evidence into account instead of only RCT or systematic reviews, meta-analyses can be applied to clinical practice guidelines uh, uh, and clinical medicine? And I know you've written about this. So I, I look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say about that. Particular. I'll tell you what I, I think is we need to deliberate. We need to talk. We need to deliberate. So one of the, um, my next paper for the British Medical Journal is coming out next week and it's on something called dysautonomia and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome in long COVID. Um, and we did a deep dive into the literature and we're doing empirical research ourselves. And what is striking in that example is the absence of not just RCT evidence, but the absence of basic observational studies. Uh, not entirely absent, because there are some, there's quite a few, but they're, they're biased, I suppose, is, is, is a good word to pick. Um, that they, they, they are done on selected populations and all that kind of thing. Um, and in that review, we had to do two things. The first thing we had to say is acknowledge that what we really want was some high quality observational cohorts to look at things like prevalence and some high quality randomized controlled trials, um, answering, asking hypothesis driven questions about the impact of this drug for this set of symptoms. We didn't have that. So what we've had to do um, is to say, well, given that this seems to be quite a big problem and the patients certainly are, are, are worrying about it, we could say, well, we're not going to write anything about this until those randomized controlled trials have been done. So we just stay, um, we wait, um, we sit on our pedestal and we say, we're not going to do anything. Or we can say, what is the evidence and what kind of a confidence interval should we be drawing around that evidence? So. Um, Miranda Wolpert and I and Harry Rutter wrote, wrote a paper on this. Um, you, every piece of data has to come with a health warning, if you like. We have contested definitions, contested evidence, people saying this is a really good study and other people saying, no, that's a bad study. This is a much better study. And the studies are, are showing different things. Um, so every statement we make in, the, in that paper that's coming out in next week's BMJ, we say, there's a high level of uncertainty around this, but you guys in clinic have got to, you've got patients in front of you. You, you still have to make a clinical decision in the absence of RCT evidence. And so we, we say, well, you've got to use your judgment. And this is actually the kind of medicine that was practiced years and years ago. And then suddenly EBM came in and we, you know, we sorted out heart attacks, we sorted out diabetes, we sorted out all sorts of things. And we thought, oh yeah, you know, we can now have, evidence-based medicine we go and find the evidence put it into practice uh, and, and you know everyone's happy but now we're working under conditions of very high uncertainty uh, so we have to look at the evidence we've got assess how much we can trust it bring it all together make a judgment and then of course we have to observe um very carefully whether what we've done uh is making the problem worse, both at an individual patient level and at the level I'm rather more interested in now at, at the sort of healthcare system level. Um, and this is why I'm getting into something called pragmatist philosophy. But again, that's another lecture. And another one of our participants has, has used the word uh, humility. So uh, you talked about scientific capital, and uh, it seems that there are multiple conflicting values in the world of the application of, yeah. of evidence. And so adjudicating uh, and deciding uh, prudently uh, among those values seems particularly salient for, yeah. for, for our yeah. profession Absolutely. because we need you know humility. But on the other hand, we are making decisions all, all the time, and those decisions have to be at once decisive and uh all, and humble at the same time how do we how do we get there how do we do that kind of both and uh approach to uh to using the best of our evidence uh and decision making while being humble about the uncertainties that linger well 
do you know what? I think that um, clinicians and clinician scientists are not taught to be humble, um, be epistemologically humble, if you like. That's that's a, a bit of a mouthful, but the the idea um, that the hallmark of good research is the awareness of the possibility of doubt. And actually the hallmark of good clinical practice is also the awareness of the possibility of doubt. I might be wrong, I might be wrong. Um, but also we're not taught to make decisions while putting uncertainty on the table. What we tend to do is hide the uncertainty you know, behind the sofa so nobody sees it. What we need to do is be explicit about the uncertainty. And that's what we've been doing in this BMJ series. It's been taking a while to get them to understand what we're trying to do there. Um, because what the BMJ are used to doing is saying, here are the facts, this is what you must do. Um, and we're saying we're not, we're not in that territory with, with long COVID. Um, so and that very first paper that, that um, I was lead author on, you know, we submitted it mid-March 2020, um, talking about the precautionary principle. Um, we were unsure of the evidence. We didn't know whether masks worked. We didn't know whether this, um, this uh, virus was spread through the air or not. But we were 100% sure that we should act. So we've separated the, the certainty about the evidence with the certainty about action. And that actually aligns with uh, what the pragmatists would do, because what you have to do to make a pragmatic decision is follow through into the future. What are the consequences of acting and what are the consequences of not acting? Um, and that's one of the things that that um, the EBM people in particular have been very, very slow to do is to say, what if we do nothing? We are responsible for those consequences. Um, of course, something terrible might happen if you act, but something even worse might happen if you don't act. And so to weigh those up and then to say, given the uncertainties, what should I do? And that is actually as true of I have this patient who gets a fast heart rate when they stand up. Should I give them evabradine, even though it's not licensed for you know, this particular condition, or should I not? Um, and you could say, I'm not giving the patient evabradine until I've seen a randomized controlled trial. Or you could say, do you know what? This patient's having a really terrible time. They haven't been able to work, blah, blah, blah. Maybe I could just give them and see if they get better. And I'm doing effectively an N of one. Uh, do you see what I mean? And and so we've actually persuaded the BMJ to publish. Yeah, you can suck it and see. And, and that philosophically, I think, is really quite radical. But of course, it's what we do all the time in clinical practice, isn't it? Really? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I think um, I'm wondering if you can comment on on some of uh, your interlocutors in this discussion over the last couple of years. One of our participants uh, writes in that they worry about the development of a sort of false, false dichotomy about uh, about EDM, EBM that, you know, on the one hand, we have potentially a flawed mental model, but on the other hand, we have this incredible uh, resource that has in many ways revolutionized uh, the quality of care that has been delivered in multiple countries over the, over the last couple of decades. So what and you mentioned this at the very beginning. I mean, how, how do we avoid falling into that false dichotomy? How, how do we make sure yeah. that we're, we're keeping yeah. both? Well, how do we not throw the baby out with the bathwater? And it's a really, really key question. What I want uh, to happen is for people within the EBM community to lead that debate. Because I think what's happened with EBM is there's there's I'm not going to say there's two kinds of people in it because I'm beginning to kind of just depict a polar polarization but but actually broadly speaking there's the ones who get the the issues that I've been talking about the ones who um who want to take EBM to the next level and then there's the ones that say 
Oh, no, you mustn't change it. Dave Sackett would turn in his grave. Um, and we must keep EBM exactly as it was when it was first uh, developed. And that, of course, is really troubling. What, what science stayed the same methodologically or anything else? And one of the problems I think with EBM um, and, you know, say systematic review of meta-analysis is it's kind of got deeper and deeper and deeper. So now you have to do meta-analysis on individual patient data or something. That's much better than just joining up all the trials. Yes, it is. But there are also, um, there's also a need for systematic review to go broader because all those meta-analyses are asking narrow questions about a tiny little topic area. Wait a minute, we also need to review topics in a broad way, like what are we gonna do about obesity? And that's okay, we can write a review about that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a review that has a different purpose. It, it's saying we need, we need to scope the topic area. And for a scoping review, you don't wanna do a meta-analysis, you might want to draw on meta-analysis. Do you see what I mean? And so you get the purists saying, oh, no, 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 you're, you're, you're making our beautiful pyramid dirty. You're, and, and people write articles. There's various articles written about me saying I used to understand it and now I've gone slightly loopy in my old age and I've, I've kind of lost it. But actually there's others within the EBM community saying, yes, absolutely, this... Um, this tradition needs a shake up it's it's got it's got it's become very mainstream you know when i first got into ebm it was young it was edgy it was it was um very exciting very challenging and now it's become very bureaucratized and um tied down and you're not allowed to challenge any of the ideas that's problematic so medical students you're the future um, read some of this stuff. If you don't like what I write, write in and challenge it because I think that debate needs to be held. Absolutely. Well, um, that's a, a great place. Unfortunately, we're we're out of time and that's a great place to come to an end with a call to continue working all of us and to challenge one another in positive ways uh, on these critical questions. And I want to uh, thank you all again for attending uh, today's Medical Center Hour. I want to thank Professor Greenhouse for uh, this high yield lecture, this discussion. Please join us next week, which is Wednesday, February 22nd, as we celebrate Medical Education Week at the University of Virginia. In collaboration with UVA's Ann L. Brody Medical Education Committee, the Medical Center Hour will host Dr. Allison Huffstetler from the Robert Graham Center for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., who will deliver a keynote on achieving social accountability in healthcare through graduate medical education. This event will be both in person at Penn Hall Auditorium and on Zoom, and during our usual time of noon to 1 p.m. Thank you again to Professor Greenhouse, and thanks to everybody for attending, and we hope to see you next week. <laughs>